You are on the Frenzy Feed. The, the Professor, Professor Frenzy, Frenzy Show! Professor Frenzy, it's a show. Professor Frenzy Show. Professor Frenzy, it's a show. Professor Frenzy Show. Hello, and welcome to The Professor Frenzy Show, episode 271. My name is Jerry. And I'm Chris. And we are your hosts. On the Professor Frenzy Show, we're going to try to spotlight some smaller publishers' comics that we think deserve some attention. We aren't going to rate or score comics. We aren't really even going to be reviewing comics. We're just going to talk about some that we think people should consider reading. So, 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 Chris, did did you read any good comics this week? Well, well, well Professor, as a matter, 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 matter of fact, I. Sure did. (laughs) Professor, thank you so much. I want a big one. Oh, man. I tell you, Professor, I don't know. This was a weird week this past week because I don't know if I had a little sense of uh, comic book burnout, a little bit of sense of apathy. It was a lighter week for me. And Mm -hmm. on on weeks where I typically take flyers on a new first issue, I kind of passed, you know, on a few. And I I, I just wasn't feeling it with some of the advanced solicits or just looking at some of the advanced previews. Nonetheless, though, nonetheless, I am very confident that we both will get some (laughs) some good good comics this week. So with that, we'll dive right in. We had a couple of mutual reads, and we'll start off with Mm -hmm. The Return of an Anthology. This is Creepshow, Volume 2, number one from Image Comics. Wow. Yeah. We had Garth Ennis and Phil Hester doing a couple of these, and we had art done by Becky Clunan and Phil Hester, priced at three ninety nine. Professor, I'm glad this is back. How about yeah, you? Yeah, definitely. Uh, in this book, we get two stories. The first is by Garth Ennis called Make Your Choice, and it follows a man who's on the toilet after a night of barbecue, and he's like, oh, my stomach, I better take care, better care of myself. But when he looks at, you know, his uh, accomplishment down there, It turns out it's a baby fetus, and it's chanting, feed me, clothe me, raise me. His wife doesn't see this vision, however, and he starts seeing fetuses everywhere on his car steering wheel and his church Bible, and sometimes mountains of fetuses at his door. He wonders why, because he thinks that, you know, him being an anti-abortion protester, etc., and he's always fought to perfect Uh, protect fetuses, that why are they coming to haunt him? And he's always done that, except that one time, and he has to tell his wife about it, and that does not go well. Uh Uh-oh. This is a good story. It was a little heavy-handed, I thought. The art was solid with strong lines and kind of a changing palette, moved from greenish to reddish colorings. Um, But, you know, I thought it was an effective story as you went through it. Now, the next story is called Fossil Record. Uh, the art is a little funny on that on that kind of splash panel, so you, it's hard to read um, <laughs> the, the title of the book uh, in the in the bones that are on the ground there, but it's Fossil Record. So we meet August, and his mother has died. Uh, he's a he's a um, a professor like, and he reads a, pa- a piece from his favorite poet archaeologist, Dr. Gottlieb Heinrich, which is crazy, and it he embarrasses himself. August is a professor, like I said, and he's studying uh, trilobites, and they all have a wound that he recognizes. He theorizes that there is a perfect predator that is undying. That's why we've never seen the fossils of them, because they never die, and they feed on other creatures. Uh, Dr. Heinrich has apparently gone crazy and is digging inside an old barn. And August visits him, but he he goes down into the pit he's digging in, and he gets freaked out by uh, the professor's request to dig beside him. He tries to escape, but one thing leads to another, and Heinrich gets stabbed by a uh, pick, you know, a digging pick. So Heinrich then comes back to life and bites August, which is the same shaped wound as on the trilobites. Uh, He runs to his mother's grave to make sure that these undead creatures don't disturb his mother's grave. How does that work out? How do you think it works out? Not too great. It's that kind of book. Uh, these are good stories. I was a little confused with the Gottlieb and Heinrich names. There was a, there was a couple of kind of it was a little difficult to keep everything straight in that second story, uh, but overall both stories were solid, uh, and this was a pretty good comic book. What did you think about Creep Show Volume Two Number One, Chris? 
Thanks, Professor. First off, welcome back, Creep Show. You've been missed. Yeah, very much. I like these little stories that have the beginning, middle, and end. I like the format. I like the color. And props to Be Becky Clunan with yeah. the artwork, especially in that first opening panel, yeah. because I don't know if our narrator of these books is actually named, and if so, I'm not sure, but I really like just how effectively she has it sort of... Uh, the creature hunched over the house as she narrates this story. And I thought that was really, really a good vibe there. As I take a step back, we've got both of these stories where we see a focal character and they meet their <laughs> predictable, but inevitable <laughs> come up. It's maybe not so predictable, but you could kind of see where things are going. Yeah. I do have to applaud though, NS, because while there probably is an underlying message with the first story, I do like how it was executed. Yeah. We, we sort of got, uh, the onion peeled back as we go along for the ride on this. And we've kind of see why is this happening to this guy? And then all of a sudden, a little more is revealed. And then something bad happens. Then a little more is revealed. Then something bad happens again. Then a little more is revealed. And we get this continuation up until the climax of the scene where, boom, the shoe drops. And then we, we, we get it. And it has this inevitable demise. You know, in, in a way, it wasn't depicted necessarily... In the book itself, it was sort of off panel yeah. with respect to that. Whereas in Hester's story, he does show us the final comeuppance and we get this beautifully executed gore that I have to <laughs> applaud Hester with because this is kind of a part of the reason why I'm, I'm paying admission for this book. I want to see some of this, you know, where we get this pick to the head and we get the eyeball popping out. I said, yes, give me this glorious gore. You know, this is what I'm, this is, this is, this is what I paid. This is what I shut up for. Yes, exactly. I think I liked the first story a little bit better, but I think I liked the way the execution was done with the requisite gore in the second story. So there are mm -hmm. little pieces I liked in both. Yeah, you know, I'm I not, agree. I'm not going to put, I'm, not, I'm trying not to put one necessarily over the other because they're each neck and neck in their yeah. own right with some with some good qualities that I like in a horror story. Yeah, they both had their strengths. Yeah, I do too. And you know, I I, I saw, I'm so glad to see Hester in this element because I. I like his Green Arrow and the stuff they does for the superhero books. Nice to see it here. Nice to see uh, Clunan doing a horror story because I thought her artwork was really good. She could draw these little fetuses that, you know, well, <laughs> oh, you, you feel for these things. And he, she she's tasked to draw so many. And I, I got to say, she really did a great job with it. So, yeah, I, all in all, I thought this was a good opening issue to the second volume. Excellent. Our thoughts and impressions on Creepshow, volume two, number one. From Image Comics, priced at three ninety nine, and yes, as you would expect, this is a book strongly for mature readers. <laughs> yes, definitely. Well, here we go. I'm eager to talk about the next one. This is the Cull. This is the second issue. Uh oh, we'll see what happens. It's from Image Comics, written by Kelly Thompson, art done by Matea De Luis, priced at three ninety nine. Professor, can you please take the floor and give us your thoughts? I will chime in. You betcha. So, a group of teens head out early one morning or night, you know, like three o'clock in the morning, to the seaside to make a short movie. They need low tide, and low tide exposes a cave they go through, and they find a magical landscape on the other side. One of the kids, Cleo, her young brother recently disappeared, and she posits that he might have come this way and into this magical land, and she decides to go look for him. The other kids talk and follow her in. They decide to film their trip, but they don't understand what this place is. It, is it an alternate earth? Is it a liminal space, kind of a place between places? Who knows? They see a funny little swimming creature and, you know, they're wading through some shallow water and this is swimming through the, the water. And then they look again and it's got a little face. Huh, a heck of a thing. They get to the isle an island by there and they see another larger, it's kind of a cat panda-like creature. They follow it for a while, but then they all have to stop to pee and then have some sexy time. Some of them do. Then they find another different creature. Very strange. This is an interesting story. I, I like the plot, and I don't think the plot and the narrative has second issue-itis. But I do feel like the characters are a little fuzzy, and the relationships just seem kind of forced. We know that Katie loves Cleo because Katie says so. And that's kind of like the, you know, you, you read the what they say and it's like, OK, that's how they feel about each other. It's very on the nose, you know, and then, of course, they kiss and you're like, OK, well, this makes sense, I guess. But I'm not really feeling the character and relationship building that I'd expect. 
Now, the art here is unique. I I, I remember some of this back in uh, Chris when we were doing the Bat Books uh, um, podcast that, you know, some of that kind of very quasi-realistic cinematic quality, you know, with kind of rounded edges, you know, that's the kind of art it has. And and I find it unusual. I won't say I really like this is a great part of, you know, type of art that I really love. But it definitely works here, and I like to see little. I like to see it occasionally, and uh, I really like how it does here. So they're beautiful, beautiful panels, and very cinematic. I'm interested in what's going on in the future in in the cull, so I'll stay on it. The title is a little frightening because it looks like it's just a normal, you know, little adventure in a weird place. But calling it the cull, which means you know a lot of people are about to get killed. Um, that makes me feel like we've got some danger ahead of us. What did you think about the cull number two, Chris? Thanks, Professor. I'll circle back to something you said, because I, I, for me, it couldn't have been understated enough that you said the character is a little fuzzy and the relationships are forced. I totally agree. In fact, I, I, I want to amp that up a couple more notches with respect to that, because... I think everyone is given so much backstory that yeah. inherently Thompson knows this, but me as a reader, I'm still trying to get a handle on everybody. Yeah. And I don't think I have that yet. Mm-hmm. It's it's too early in the game. And I think we, we might have one too many characters in the cast for me to get a relationship vibe. I'm not necessarily expecting to know everybody out of the gate, but I do want to know people's names. And I kind of want to know that as I go into this book yeah. and remember, oh, this person has this background, this person does this, this person cuts her herself, this person is in love with this person. Okay, okay. Right. It seems like they're, 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 they've all been pre-established, but I, I'm sort of walking into the middle act of a play, yes. and I really don't know what's going on here with respect to it. The other little quibble I have, you're in this other dimension where if you take a wrong step, you might go God knows where. <laughs> you don't know what's happening. <laughs> There's so many different dimensions within dimensions with dimensions. Now, I get the horny teenager syndrome, okay? But that said, you tell me you're not in here, but for more than a couple of minutes, and then you feel compelled to make love right now at this moment instead of taking it all in? I just don't know. Now, having to go pee, I can see that. Yes, yeah, that, you know, that you're excited. Sense. That makes sense. Having to make love right then and there... Uh, I would think you'd have be able to put the, put the meter on pause for a little bit, get your bearings. <laughs> then if you're so inclined as the horny teenager, go right ahead. Be my guest. But I thought that was maybe a little too soon. Uh, just me. I don't know. I'm with you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, that said, <laughs> I, I conversely, I like the way Thompson, though, does give us this background because I don't necessarily want one dimensional characters in this land. Mm-hmm. I want them to have some scars and I want them to have some emotional heft and weight. We do have that, but I think I want to know a little bit more about this going in. I I said at the last time we talked about the call, I couldn't help but make comparisons to Stranger Things, and I couldn't help make uh, comparisons to Paper Girls. There's a little bit of that here still. Nonetheless, though, I am staying on board, but it's very tentatively, but my gosh, the Matea yeah. de Luis's artwork is just gorgeous panel after panel, the way everything's yeah. magnificently rendered from the backdrops to the facial expressions to just the way th- things are set from looking things at a distance, from looking at things from other characters' point of view. I feel really immersed in this world, and I'm getting the whole periphery as if I'm there and doing a 360 panoramic. It's that good. It's that gorgeous. Yeah. The colors are fantastic. Everything beautifully is rendered in this book and it does give us something of a cliffhanger mm-hmm. so i have to give award some points for that respect of it the only thing though i had and i picked this book up eagerly but with trepidation because i thought chris can you tell me at least two of the characters names in the call and i honestly couldn't do it and i think right now if you were <laughs> <Yes>. to depress me <laughs> I, I, I still can't remember anybody Perhaps maybe Cleo, but other than that, I'm really not sure who who else is who in this. And I, yeah. I kind of wish we had a little more breathing room and we mm. got to know a, a bit more back them. Now, granted, Thompson is doing this at her own pace. We get to see, okay, this character likes to cut herself. This character is in a previous relationship. Okay. But I think we need a little bit of moment to breathe and we have to have some of the narrative explain who these people are, why should we should feel invested with them, mm-hmm. and then... W- moving on and giving us a scary scene. That's why Paper Girls did so many things effectively and it made it look easy. And this book is trying and it does an admirable job, but I am 
still staying on board because I'm here for that gorgeous artwork, yeah. but I really, really want to get a handle on the characters. Like I said previously, maybe one character too many. That said, I am enjoying the call for particular reasons, but not for entire reasons. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And we we know a lot of facts about the characters, but I don't feel like I know what it would be like to be in a room with them like you can in a lot of books, you know? Mm, um, well said. Yeah, and I think that's the difference. We're getting loaded up with information, not people. And uh, hopefully that'll change. Okay. Our thoughts and impressions on The Call. This was the second issue. This was from Image Comics. It was priced at three ninety nine, And it is a book for a teen plus audience. Chris, what other books do you read this week? Thanks, Professor. Real quick, I just had two others. I had House of Slaughter number 17 from Boom Studios, written by Sam Johns, art done by Letizia Kedenichi, priced at $3.99. Per the advanced solicit, while Bate does his best to ignore the cruelty of the children in the home with him, a monstrous assault leaves him with more questions than answers. What does Nanette, the mysterious girl who's been one of the only ones to show Bate kindness and keeping the monsters indoors at bay, have to do with the monsters on the outside, end of quote, end of advanced listen. Okay, now in this one, a young boy monster killer named Bait is trying to find his footing in a house with other kids where there are impending monsters. He oversleeps his first night there and meets the rest of his housemates on the next morning. Tough because Bait really doesn't talk. The man of the house notes Bait is only given the first name or first initial, the letter B, on his records, which leads to the nickname of Big Man, which leads to the initials BM, which leads to a lot of teasing from a kid. <laughs> Bait meets Nanette, Nan for short, a girl a bit older, and he's instantly lovestruck. Bait takes out some monsters during the night, and when he checks in and spies on Nanette that night, he sees her talking that monsters are coming out to be continued. Per my notes, as with Something is Going the Children, this title is a slow burn horror book and similar in artwork and panel layout. I did like that we see Bates' instant reaction thoughts <laughs> depicted in this black and white. And it's it's him exacting harm to those dissing him with this instant reaction or his love of Nan. And I really like how that was executed that we get in this character's head. Now, the previous issue, the conclusion of it kind of sort of led me to think that there was maybe a cliffhanger in the works with a night monster attack right on the onset of this issue, but it didn't happen. I came to realize, though, if I look at these titles, Something is Killing the Children, and House of Slaughter, and if I look at it from a perspective of a good horror serial, okay, it's really effective in that manner. Not necessarily a lot happened here, but if you were looking for a bait versus the monster scene, we were given that, and we get something of a love interest for bait, and presumably we'll learn more about her in the next issue. Those were my thoughts and impressions on House of Slaughter. This was issue 17 already. This was part two of the Alabaster Arc. It was priced at $3.99, and it is a book rated for a teen 13-plus audience. Awesome. Well, next up, I took a flyer on a title called St. John. This was St. John number one. It was from Dark Horse Comics. It was written by Dan Schade and Brennan Wagner, are done by Dan Schade, per the advanced solicit. In a partnership with groundbreaking clothing brand Portland Gear, Dark Horse Comics is proud to present the Roses City's very own superhero, St. John. Cynical Manhattan writer Tori Slate travels to Portland, Oregon, to track down the enigmatic St. John. <laughs> A masked man who roams the city doing good deeds for strangers, appearing at random and vanishing without a trace. Who is he? Why does he do it? And what is his seemingly supernatural connection to the City of Roses? Tori aims to put these questions to the man himself, unaware that the answers will change her life forever. End of quote, end of advance solicit. In this one, reporter Tori goes to Portland, Oregon to do a story about a mysterious hero named St. John. While on a train from the airport, she sees a man choking, and, as if on cue, St. John shows up and gives the choking man the Heimlich maneuver. This seems to be a pattern for the rest of the book. St. John shows up out of nowhere when someone has a problem, and then seems to disappear just as quick, or when Tori's around, he's there long enough to give her a soundbite. St. John apparently got his name after the St. John Bridge, where he saved someone who lost her job and father from jumping off of the same said bridge. St. John takes care of problems, big or small, and is the soul of the city, and it's destined that Tori will encounter him again. <laughs> That's it. Mm-hmm. Per my notes, I really like the art in this book. The characters have a very are very distinctive. 
Tori's given this real prominent nose. I like that, you know, she's not necessarily the gorgeous female reporter in this one. She She's sort of like an every woman, and I kind of like that. The artwork is cartoony, but not in a pejorative way. I knew nothing of the clothing tie-in with this book going into it. And if it was here in this book, I really don't think it was that blatant. I was just looking for a new superhero book, and that's why I got on board. Now, I'm not really familiar with the Portland, Oregon area to really know if any of the sites or landmarks depicted are accurate. I will say that Tori is a charismatic character. Now, St. John, I'm really not sure yet. This book also didn't have any villain, somewhat unusual for a superhero comic book. And I'm asking myself, do we need one? I'm not sure yet. But for all the book's niceties, there seems to be a lack of real any serious threat. This was a welcome light read for me, but I'll have to check in with all the important second issue to see if I'm going to remain on board. So those are my thoughts and impressions on St. John, number one from Dark Horse Comics, priced at $4.99. I don't think I saw a rating on this, but I'd probably safe to say it's rated for 18 audience. Great. Well, with that, Professor, I'll turn the baton <laughs> off to you. What other books did you read this week? Well, I just had one. I Hate Fairyland, volume two, number nine, from Image, written by Scotty Young, with art by Brett Bean, and that's $3.99. So Teen Gert has been killed by Little Gert. So we were following her again like we did in Volume 1. That was weird, but here we are. So uh, <laughs> Little Gert visited a now middle-aged Duncan Dragon, and they realized that he doesn't have the map that he needs to get them out of Fairyland. This is, of course, Gert's fault. Now they go to leave, but Duncan's witch, uh, Terabella, doesn't want him to go. Uh, Duncan Dragon breaths her into ashes. So he, you know, flames her and she turns into ashes. And the drag and Duncan and Gert head to a pub to talk plans about how to get the map. Terabella reconstitutes herself and wants revenge. And she sends a minion to the pub with a potion that will turn Duncan into a real dragon. However, Gert gets the potion instead turns into a dragon, and torches all Terabella's pals. Before she can defeat Terabella, though, Gert is turned back into a girl and falls from a great height. How to get Duncan's map and leave Fairyland. That's the problem. They are going to have to talk to the imprisoned ex-queen Claudia, who really hates Gert. This was insane as I expected. I guess we fully changed back to following grade school Gert instead of uh, young adult Gert that we started volume two with. Okay, I have made the shift and <laughs> I am moving forward. Count me in. I like this Fairyland craziness and um, I'm not going to stop reading it. So that is I Hate Fairyland, volume two, number nine. There are a couple other books we didn't quite get to. One is Kill More, number one from IDW, written by Scott Wilson, with art by Matt Fuchs, and that's $3.99. Coda, volume two, number one from Boom Studios, written by Simon Spurrier, with art by Mateus Bergara, and that's $4.99. And Bloodborne, the Bleak Dominion, number one from Titan Comics, written by Cullen Bunn, with art by Peter Kowalski, and that's $3.99. And today is Wednesday. What books are you looking for this week, Chris? <laughs> Thanks, Professor. Well, if you thought last week was a light week, well, Whoa. let's flip the script for you. How yep. about this? We've got Lonesome Hunters, The Wolf Child, number three from Dark Horse Comics, written by Tyler Crook, art done by Tyler Crook. It's priced at three ninety nine. Bone Orchard Mythos, Tenement, number four from Image Comics, is out today, written by Jeff Lemire, art done by Andrea Sortino, and Dave Stewart. It's three ninety nine. dollars Fish Flies, number two from Image ah. Comics, is out today, written and drawn by Jeff Lemire. It's five ninety nine. dollars Haunt You to the End, number four from Image slash Top Cow is out. Written by Ryan Cady, art done by Andrea Moody, it's three ninety nine. dollars Hexagon Bridge, number mm -hmm. one, is out today from Image Comics. This looks intriguing. It's written by Richard Blake, art done by Richard Blake, it's three ninety nine. dollars yeah. Click Click Boom, number four from Image is out today. Written by Doug Wagner, art done by Doug yeah. Dobbs and Matt Wilson, it's three ninety nine. dollars Saga, number 66 from Image Comics is out today. Written by Brian K. Vaughn mm -hmm. and art done by Fiona Staples, it's three ninety nine. dollars Black Smith, Key to His Heart, number four from Ahoy Comics, is out to date. Written by Eric Palicki, art done by Wendell Calvacanti. 
It's $3.99. And we also have Chilling Adventures Presents, Madam Satan, Hell on Earth, number one. It's a one-shot from Archie Comics Horror, written by Elliot Rahal, art done by Ricardo Federici, $3.99. Wow, that's a lot of books. Yeah. Right there, that is a ton of books. But hang on. Oops. If you thought I was finished, oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, Wait no. a second. Professor, could you enlighten us on what else is out today, please? Sure can. Grim, number 13 from Boom Studios, written by Stephanie Phillips, with art by Flaviano, and that's $3.99. Money Shot comes again, number four from Vault Comics, written by Tim Seeley with art by Giselle Legas, and that's $4.99. Queen of Swords, a barbaric tale, number three from Vault Comics, written by Michael Morici with art by Corin Hallen, that's $4.99. Rare Flavors, number one from Boom Studios, written by Rom V with art by Felipe Andrade, and that's $4.99. Something is Killing the Children, number 33 from Boom Studios, written by James Tynan IV, with art by Werther Deladera, and that's $3.99. Big Game, number 3 from Image Comics, written by Mark Miller, with art by Pepe Larraz, and that's $3.99. The Madness, number 2 of 6 from AWA, written by J. Michael Straczynski, with art by Aiko and David Lorenzo, and that's $3.99. Monarch, number six, from Image Comics, written by Rodney Barnes, with art by Alex Linz, and that's $3.99. Noctera, number 16, from Image Comics, written by Scott Snyder, with art by Tony S. Daniel and Marcelo Maiolo, and that's $3.99. And Scrapper, number three, from Image Comics, written by Alex DeCampi, with Cliff Blazinski, and art by Ryan Kelly and Jordi Belair, and that's $3.99. Goodness me. What do you think about this week's books, Chris? <laughs> well, Professor, I hope you're sitting down. I think that Chilling Adventures, yes. <laughs> Archie Horror book, is nothing against the all ages book, but I think I this one might be for a little, little bit for the uh, bigger kids and the grownups okay. there. So that, <laughs> looking, looking forward to that. I, I think both of us are really looking forward to Queen of Swords Barbaric. Oh, yeah. This will probably be a bounce back. But uh, some of these books, I, I'm trying to remember where they left off, uh -huh. you know, with uh, Fireflies and Monarch. I think this is the final issue of this particular story. Noctera, yep. wow, I, I, I'm really not sure. Scrapper, it's still on my radar, but this is something that I am not sure I'm going to stay with. So we'll see what happens. Same with Noctera. God bless Scott Snyder, Antonio Daniel. Uh, these are sort of falling out of my inner periphery yeah. of, of favorite titles. Uh, Saga, where have you been? I, I'm, and Hexcon Bridge, the advanced elicit really, really looked good. So that one is good. Of course, Tenement number four, I'm sure that's going to knock it out of the part with the artwork. It's an interesting blend, and it's a lot of books, a lot of books. Yeah. Professor, what are your thoughts and impressions? Well, it's just funny. Fishfly seems like it was so long ago. I could probably go back to the, to our old scripts and see when it was, but it seems like it was more than a month ago. Uh, and I don't know why, because I don't really follow <laughs> that kind of stuff, the publishing information. Uh, it's kind of like a lot of classics. Something's Killing the Children, Saga, Barbaric, and Bone Orchard Mythos. Um, you know, some of our, some of my favorite books, and they're all coming back. And we, you know, I had three books this week, and I'm going to have nine, at least nine next week. Um, we've got something new from Rom V, one of my favorite writers. And like he said, Hexagon Bridge looks really interesting. This is going to be a great week in indie comics kind of feels like old times pre-pandemic times but uh, i'm looking forward to it now uh last saturday Spenguli showed mr sardonicus what'd you think about the movie chris professor i have to applaud you and your song we'll get to that in a moment that was really really good oh. I, this is through no fault of the talented cast and just the way the characters look, just the way the characters acted, just the way the film was shot. All marvelous stuff. I, I really thought everyone did an exemplary job. But whenever I think of the movie, I can't help but think of Castle's narration in the opening and just yep. just the charm he brings out and just the novelty of this holding the card at the end <laughs> you know, with everything and how he does that. That's That seems to tend to be through no fault of anything else, what I tend to remember when I think of Mr. Sardonicus. That said, I, I am hoping, since I rewatched it, that the story itself is going to be a little more entrenched in my mind because I think it's a little bit better than I remembered it. So I want to give characters their due and the mm -hmm. acting their due with respect to it. But I really like how Castle comes out there and he's asking the audience to hold up their cards 
and he's kind of play acting with it. You know, he's asking, you know, uh, <laughs> ma'am, you know, I can't see. Can you move? Hey, kid, can you uh, sit down a little bit? <laughs> yes. Kid. And then he's pretending to count, literally, <laughs> ba, 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 doing the math, carrying the whatever number, <laughs> just you know, as if as if this is actually happening in the audience. Can you imagine I if the, the if the theater was half empty <laughs> and there was like literally nobody there? <laughs> how this would have played out, you know, if you were still literally there. But Castle really sells it. You know, and I, I yeah, want to say he's almost like a Stanley of horror movies, but I don't want to say that by any means to take anything away from anybody. But I just like the showmanship that yes. this guy brings to the table with this. And I think there's a little bit of natural charm. He seems like a likable guy. He's got this kind of, uh, he's like winking at you, but he's not really winking, but he's sort of in on it. And I really like that. And I like his smile and I like his showmanship. Yeah. And for that, I really, really applaud him. The, the characters were fine. I, I really th- Thought everyone did a good job with this one. I don't know if I found the Sardonicus face perhaps necessarily scary as as I might have. And I'm trying to think, that would I have found it scary as a child? And I, I, I don't know. I think it is sort of grim. It's sort of ghoulish. And I'm trying to think, well, things maybe in a different time period were sort of elevated, you know, yeah. with, with things being, once you see something really creepy, <laughs> that, oh, yeah, this, this could have made... A woman from turn of the century, you know, go to the fainting couch and right. t- t- do her thing. But yeah, I, I think there was a little bit of things at play here with with our doctors involved and just the way the characters, there was sort of like an underlying nicety and respect to them. Now, granted, this one guy does uh, get knocked out, but we, we sort of see how this plays out. And I do like the way we had a conclusion it's a good movie. I I think it's sort of different from some of the other Castle features, but I think it's a unique film, and it is certainly worth a viewing if you're a horror fan. Yeah. Professor, your thoughts and impressions? Yeah, I think it's a solid movie. Um, you know, the acting is generally pretty good. The plot is pl- makes sense. At least there's not like, you know, what happened to the stagecoach? You know, there's like, it, it all kind of makes sense. Uh, and Castle does that. He makes movies with solid characters, relationships, and gives you... It's kind of like a sideshow scare, you know? It's just like, you know, woo, freaky, and everybody smiles afterwards. I did find that the uh, Sardonicus's wife, Maud, sometimes was weak, and sometimes she would just sit in a scene with her very pretty face, you know, whether she, she might even be tied up with a rope around her neck, and she's just like... All right. Well, all right. Here I am. I'm sitting here. You know, like no terror, no nothing. Just she was very, very flat, I found. Um, You know, I think the Castle movies all generally work, but very few of them would get like more than like two and a half stars out of five. I don't think they're great, great movies, but I think they're very good movies. And the one probably uh, exception is uh, House on Haunted Hill. My question is, and I asked this on Twitter, we talked to, went back and forth a little with Mac, uh, Mac Rocks, about why wasn't this called Baron Sardonicus instead of Mr. Sardonicus? He was a baron. Uh, why, you know, doesn't Bar- Baron Sardonicus sound cooler? Sound like a better movie? I don't know. Uh, and also the, like, when they showed uh, Sardonicus before his face went crazy, the character didn't seem like it was the same guy as, like, he was very, very cruel and vicious after he became a baron and seemed like a pretty swell guy with a with a nasty wife and a, and a dad he missed. So I, I don't see the connection between the pre-face baron and the post-face baron, but, you know, it's just a movie. <laughs> Well, Professor, I really enjoyed the parody song that you did. Thank you. I have to say, you knocked it out of the park again. Listeners, if you haven't subscribed to the Professor Frenzy channel on YouTube, please do me a favor. Go there, type in Professor Frenzy in the search bar. Once you're there, please subscribe. And then while you're there, you'll see the whole library of the fantastic parody songs that Professor Frenzy has done. You will laugh and you'll be amazed by... My co-host's talented writing and musicianship. My gosh, Professor. Fortune Rise, Fortune's Fall. Yeah. Please. Wow. Uh, mind blown. Mind blown. Oh. How, what, what, what happened here? What, what, what was the uh, genesis of this one? How did, how did you execute it? It was the, uh, it's the guitar part. I really like playing the guitar part. It goes, it goes along with the melody. Uh, I love playing it. And, and I wanted to do something in a lot of my previous songs. They're very, um, I do the, the drums and I, I kind of lock them 
directly onto a onto a grid, a timing grid. I use MIDI um, and just make sure that the drum beats are just about perfect so I can kind of build the song up on that. And I think that works great, and that's been working great for me, but I wanted to try to be a little more organic, so I did the drums on, on just drum pads, didn't didn't do anything with the timing, didn't adjust it at all, just kind of played it, and then played the guitar over it. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think you can tell. I don't think I'm a completely solid drummer because I'm one of the worst drummers in the world. But, you know, I think it, it more or less worked out. Um, and uh, I probably would have fixed a couple things if I had more time, but I didn't, so I didn't. And I'm kind of thinking that with these songs, I have about uh, eight or nine of them now. So I'm thinking of putting a, 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 some of them together to do a, like a live set, like 45 minutes of music, and then get a band together to kind of punch up the songs and play them live and maybe re-record them. Who knows? Um, so, yeah, I have a song planned for next week and also a few I wrote for other projects. And I think I have 12 songs. I think I might need to get up to 15, though. But it's uh, super exciting, and I just love writing these tunes. Next week, Return of the Vampire, Chris. I love that movie. Professor, it's been a while since I've seen it, so I'm looking forward to it, too. Should be a lot of fun. Really enjoying the camaraderie with all the Sven Pals mm -hmm. on social media. So please, yeah. uh, get on board. You you will have a great time. Yeah, and uh, now, as Chris mentioned before, don't forget, we're putting up this, this podcast on YouTube. So if it's more convenient for you to listen on YouTube, now you can. And don't forget, we have a new segment, Frenzy Faves, and that's coming up shortly, just after this segment where we talk about Chris, you know that guy? You know the guy that was in that show. He's that guy you know. He's that guy in the show. That guy in the show. Oh, hey, right, yes. right. Professor, yeah, this is another great suggestion, oh, and so it came good. in from our regular longtime listener and fellow podcasting pal, Clinton. Clinton, we'll give you a plug in a moment, oh, but yeah. this was another outstanding suggestion that you gave us for our particular episode this week. And I really, really am scratching my chin thinking, no, why didn't I think of this one? I Professor, know. this week's that guy in that show is a gal, and this one is Lynn Thigpen. Yes. Professor, can you enlighten myself and the rest of our listening audience about the talented Lynn Thigpen? You betcha. Lynn Thigpen was born Sherilyn Teresa Thigpen on December 22nd, 1948 in Joliet, Illinois, USA. Lynn Thigpen was originally going to be a teacher and actually taught high school English while she studied theater at the University of Illinois. In 1971, she moved to New York City and was in a lot of plays. So in theater, she did Godspell, The Night That Made America Famous, The Magic Show, Working, Tin Types, and she won a Tony Award in 1997 for his role as Dr. Judy Kaufman in An American Daughter. She was also uh, associate artistic director of the Circle Repertory Company uh, with Austin Pendleton, which is a big deal in New York. So the movie she was in was Godspell, The Warriors, Lean on Me, uh, the 2000 uh, redo of Shaft, Bicentennial Man, Anger Management, and that was with uh, Adam Sandler and Jack Nicholson. She was in Tootsie, Streets of Fire, Sweet Liberty, Running on Empty, Bob Roberts, The Paper, and Blank Man. Some pretty good movies in there. On television, she was in, she was the chief in Where in the World is Carmen San Diego, Bear in the Blue Big, in the Big Blue House, All My Children, The District, Gimme a Break, LA Law, Law and Order, The Days and Nights of Molly Dodd, Homicide, Side, Life on the Street, Sesame Street, 30 something, Lou Grant, Love Sydney, Gimme a Break. Spencer for Hire, The Equalizer, Frank's Place, she was in Roseanne, FM, Hunter, The Cosby Show, and King of the Hill. She had some uh, awards uh, she, in 1992. She won an Obie Award for Bozeman and Lena in 97, uh, as I mentioned, a Tony Award for Best Featured Actress in a Play in American Daughter. And in 2000, uh, she won an Obie Award for Jar the Floor. Uh, one honor she has is in Joliet, Illinois, you might be going to the Lynn Thigpen Elementary School. That is cool. My personal memory of Lynn Thigpen, 
and this is a funny one to remember her by because you don't see her whole face, is as the radio DJ in The Warriors. She gives kind of a narration and a sense of direction to the story. She ex- suggests that, you know, all the other gangbangers get the Warriors because of their misdeeds, but they didn't really do it. And then once the kind of word gets around that the Warriors aren't the bad guys, she sends the word around that maybe they deserve a break because it was all a misunderstanding. But her ever-present vibe gives a real eeriness and danger to the Warriors, making you feel like the whole city was against them. I loved it. And you didn't really even see her face, her whole face. It was just the the voice and, and the vibe, and she was so smooth and cool. Lynn Thigpen sadly passed March 12, 2003 at the age of 54 in Marina del Rey, California of a cerebral hemorrhage. She had been complaining of a headache for a few days and unfortunately passed far too young. Chris, what are some of your memories of Lynn Thigpen? Thanks, Professor. As what sometimes happens when we do this segment, you know, I hear the name and I think, oh yeah, I know who this person is. And then I think, Oh, I thought of somebody else. But then I see the face and I go, oh, of course. Yeah. Absolutely. Now I know exactly who you're talking about. Yeah. Lynn Thigpen, very, very talented. Now, probably has huge bodies of work that people know her for. If you're a regular viewer of All My Children, mm-hmm. if you're a regular viewer of Where in the World is Army, Carmen San Diego, that's Lynn Thigpen. You see her a lot. For me, I can't catch these shows because Where in the World is Carmen San Diego, that was sort of after my time and I, I don't get a lot of watch uh, soaps, you know, during the day, of course. So that, that said, my first memory though of Lynn Thigpen, of course, was as Lynn in Godspell, the movie with Victor Garber as Jesus. And that is one of the first musicals I saw. Mm-hmm. And if you're thinking of a musical, an atypical musical, maybe you're thinking of Oklahoma where you got like a back setting. This Godspell was so contemporary and it was just so yeah. mind blowing to me at the age I saw it because this was sort of that contemporary feel where you have people in the wild clothing and the hippie movement and they're barefoot. And Professor, I'm going to get off on a tangent here a little quick, but I remember back in the day, you were, I cannot begin to stress to a generation now that how many people walked around barefoot back then. Uh, and it just was so mind blowing because I, you, you, of all the perils that you have, aren't your feet hot on the pavement? What about running, stepping on a stone or a piece of glass, you know, but so many people I, where I was as, as a kid in sort of at the tail end of the hippie movement, I can remember these people and I would sort yeah. of gauge their hippiness on how black their feet were and how dirty they were. You know, <laughs> the dirtier the feet, the, the more hippie they were to me, the you know, because they, were. They, they, they were so, the, the, they had not set their feet in any water that I could see for such a long time. And they walked out on public. They walked into stores, you know, nothing was thought of it. You know, you really didn't see too many signs that said no shoes, no service, get out. I mean, a no, lot of people no. walked around barefoot back then. Anyway, I digress. Let's get back to Lee Lake Ben. Yeah. What a movie with uh, Victor Garber is Jesus. You know, I saw the S on the shirt thinking, Hey, this is going to be sort of Superman-ish. No, 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 no. This is biblical. And I really got the feel and the vibe of this. And as a kid looking at Godspell, it was like adults were sort of portrayed in medium, like films and TV, two different ways. You had a guy wearing a suit and a tie or else he was a hippie. There was no middle of the road, really, when you're watching TV back in the day. People either gentlemen wore suits or they were a hippie. There was no sort of in the middle. (laughs) It was so weird (laughs) back back then when you saw the adults. And it it was sort of refreshing to see these adults being free and liberated and singing and just doing their own thing and not necessarily on the clock and going to work and punching a time card. No, they were out there. They were doing their own thing and they were into music and they were into dancing. And boy, could that cast of Godspell sing. Very, very talented stuff. Lynn Thigben had a solo. She had her own number in that particular film, Bless the Lord. Really, really, really outstanding. A lot of people in the cast did a great job. Professor, as I got a little older, one of the taboo movies that I had to see when the parents weren't around was The Warriors. <laughs> that was that. <laughs> so that, that came at me, you know, well, oh, HBO show on The Warriors at 11 p.m. Hmm, mom and dad turned in about 1030. I think if I stay up, I can kind of <laughs> make my way to one of the TV sets in the basement or downstairs to pop that on. And yeah, uh, very, very effective role as the DJ in that one. Warriors, a cold film now, still recognized in people love it and still dress up. You could, you could see somebody dressed up as the warriors and you could say, Oh, you're, that's who you're dressed up for Halloween. They have, I mean, oh, this, yeah. that has such a standing uh, presence even to this day, decades later. And I thought she for did sure. a great, great job with that. So that said, professor, you circled back to a few other things. I want to mention uh, Tootsie fantastic role. Some of the films, maybe not as popular as that though. Lean on me did an outstanding job with that one and the paper. 
yeah. a marvelous, marvelous movie. If you can find it, check it out. A movie that ne- doesn't necessarily age well with respect to the medium. But if you think about it, it really, to me, wasn't that long ago. But if you want to see what like the the working style of the paper was, the newspaper, that medium, the, the people getting the story, the, the timing, the addition, having to write things really fast and to get that scoop. So many elements of there that are kind of gone by the wayside now. Boy, how fast did the newspaper medium basically kind of kind of crash? Yeah, and that's okay. sort of forgotten right now. But that's something to really look at. And I, I really like the flavor of that as somebody who was a communications major back in college. That's something I want to look for and take a peek at now because I really want to see how that's aged now in the particular news medium and how we get our news these days sure. to then and how, how vital the newspaper was the lifeblood of how, how you receive news back then and how it sort of just seemed to evaporate overnight, if you will. And it, it's really, really fascinating. Anyway, I digress, but Lynn Thigpen was talented in everything I saw her in. I probably will most remember her for Godspell and the Warriors, but I don't want to fall asleep on the movies, lean on me and the paper. Great, great stuff. So this week's That Guy in That Show is Lynn Thigpen. He's that guy, you know. He's that guy in that show. That guy in that show. And now it's time to check out our frenzy faves. Not just another Tom Baker day. These are our frenzy faves. <laughs> okay, well, Professor... We're going to flip the script a little bit. In the <laughs> last one, we, we we looked at some of the more evil women in horror movies, and you countered it. And I really like the way you did a nice pivot here. I finally got the word pivot in. I'm so glad. <laughs> this one is our favorite heroic women in horror. Wow. Ooh, that's a good one. So kick it off, Chris. What are some of your favorite heroic women in horror? Professor, once again, I have to feel compelled that I have to list some honorable mentions right. here. So if you'll indulge me, I'll, I'll try to make this quick when we get to our respective top three lists. First up, I had Sally, played by Marilyn Burns in the film The Texas Chainsaw Massacre in 1974. I think we can't help but get into a topic of a, quote, final girl trope when we get into the, some of these movies that we're going to discuss. I felt so bad that the character was killed off in the remake. Well, of course, it had to be happened, but uh, I think this character really deserved a better fate, I thought. Mm. Professor, you hit me up to a movie called Black Christmas uh, oh. not too long ago, and I want to give a shout out to Olivia Hussey, who so played Jess good. in that film. I thought she was worthy of, uh, of a mention. Uh, one of the early horror movies I saw as a kid, The Shining. So I am going to give a shout out to the character Wendy, played by Shelley Duvall, who I thought really did an outstanding Ooh, job. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Being tasked with <laughs> a, door, a demented Jack Nicholson all along and all alone in this big hotel along with her son. But a holy cow. Director. Yes, that, that too. <laughs> Boy, I, I'm sure we could hear, hear some stories, oh, but man. yeah, the great, great uh, stuff there. I, I felt remiss. But if I started to go into the late 70s, early 80s, the 80s, the 90s, there would be so many quote final girls that I just oh, would overlook yeah. some. And I know some listeners are screaming at the at me right now saying, how could you overlook this one? How could you overlook that one? Because I really don't have anything from the 80s or the 90s on my list. I felt mm-hmm. compelled, though, to include something, at least in this century. So I'm going to include the character Jamie Height in the movie oh. It Follows. Perhaps I'm showing some of the Detroit bias that I have in this one, but I thought It <laughs> Follows is an outstanding horror film. And I thought Moore did a great, great job as Jamie Height in this film, being tasked with all that she had to do. And I thought It Follows was one of my more favorite uh, contemporary horror movies by contemporary i'm saying within all oh, the last 10 years or 15 years or so i really really liked it follows mm. okay so i listed all my honorable <laughs> mentions so i'll get to the third choice on my list and once again this might be a bit of a cheat because i don't know if you necessarily would consider this a horror film but i think the focal horror character in this movie hannibal lecter would be a real scary scary yes. scary movie villain so with that My third choice is Clarice Starling, portrayed by Jodie Foster, first in The Silence of the Lambs. And I also have to mention Julianne Moore in the portrayal that she had as Clarice Starling in Hannibal. That said, Jodie Foster won an Academy Award for her performance. It was a masterful, masterful job with her matching wits with Anthony Hopkins as the out there Hannibal Lecter. Mm -hmm. This was a thrill a second. This was something that you were on the edge of your seat for. Just with even these characters not saying a word, just their presence creeped you out. They emoted so much just with their respective acting on both sides. This was a great battle of wits. 
These were both characters, both actors, ramping up their game, bringing their A-game to this, and I thought they really, really did a great job. I don't want to underscore Julianne Moore in the sequel that she did with reprising the role of Clarice Starling. That said, though, I have to mention Clarice Starling on this list, and that is my third choice. Professor, I will hand it to you. Could you please tell us who your if you have any honorable mentions, and if so, who is your third choice on this list? You bet. Great call on uh, Olivia Hussey, by the way. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, I'll give an honorable met- mention to Greta Schroeder as Ellen Hutter in the 1922 Nosferatu. Hmm. She kept Dracula until sunrise, you know, letting him bite her, bite her, bite her until the sun came up and killed her. And uh, that's uh, that, you know, it's a terrifying but heroic thing that she did. And, and I think that she gets passed over a lot uh, from being, uh, you know, a, a hero in horror movies. So that's definitely Greta Schroeder as Ellen Hutter. So my number three pick would be Emily Perkins as Bridget Fitzgerald in Ginger Snaps. 2000 mm. um and you know she was in all the 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 um sequels as well so bridget's sister older sister is bitten by a werewolf and she has to help her through the disease's progress and she works with a local drug dealer to come up with an antidote this is a really good movie it it talk it shows uh, her and her sister who are have a kind of a death fetish they take pictures of themselves um purportedly you know committing suicide and various things and uh, people, you know, love them. And, and Bridget is the younger, not-so-pretty sister um, with a insane wig on, big black. Her hair is crazy. And it's just her and her relationship with, his sis- with her sister as her sister, it changes as she becomes more werewolfy. And she starts, there's a kind of a 20-something-year-old uh, drug dealer guy who there's definitely a, a weird attraction. You know, she's a high school, you know, and a younger high school girl, and there's some weird stuff going on there, weird intentions going on there. And just, it's she's fascinating, and she's great, and she loves her sister and is trying to do the right thing, even as everybody's against her. So I think Emily Perkins did a great job as Bridget Fitzgerald in Ginger Snaps. All right, Chris, what else you got? Well, Professor, I have to commend you on your selections up to date so far because I'm banging my head against the table because I can't believe I forgot Nosferatu and I can't believe I forgot Ginger Snaps. I'm so glad you put that out there. So thank you very much. I thought those were excellent calls. You're welcome. Thank you. Two good movies. Thank you. Well, the second person I had on my list is someone that the second chase and my first choice were no-brainers and I have to preface this by saying I came at this movie sort of in my adolescence and I was just surprised and blown away by the ending. And I have to kind of say maybe uh, a preteen Chris was sort of sexist because I thought there should be a hero at the end of the movie, but having a woman as the last man standing or last person standing, if you will, was a really effective job. And the person that I'm going to choose is Ellen Ripley, yeah. played by Sigourney Weaver in the Alien franchise. When I first saw the character in Alien, I thought I was really mesmerized by this, I get to say it, all-star cast of characters that we Definitely. had in the particular first movie. And it was an outstanding, outstanding job. My father had some reluctance for me seeing the first Alien, but he, after him viewing it, he let me see this one. And I was just mesmerized by the talented cast and just him being a science fiction fan slash horror and just passing that on his love of those things onto me. And I really, really, really enjoyed it. I felt a little cheated though, as a kid, because I had so much love for this movie, but I could only talk to it with other fellow grownups or somebody Mm. who was maybe a little bit older because there was nobody in my immediate circle who was allowed to watch the film, but I really, really enjoyed it. (laughs) Once the sequel Aliens came out, this was at a time I was a little bit older, and we I remember seeing this with my entire family the opening night it came out. Boy, heck, oh my gosh, what a marvelous, marvelous performance. I did not think Alien could be topped in any way, but I was blown away, and I dare say I may be like Aliens more than the first one, which Mm. is blasphemy. I hate, but (laughs) I have some, I think I'm a little bit biased because of the time and seeing it with my dad and having that experience of the film going thing happening there that I didn't have with Aliens, just basically seeing it by myself on cable. Mm -hmm. Movie going, 
experiences are not to be diminished when you go and see it in a crowd and when you see it on an opening night. I think that really ramps up your memories with respect to giving the film a fondness that it may not necessarily have with just itself with the story and the acting. Mm. And boy, did Sigourney Weaver really, really deliver a great performance. Yeah. Alien 3, of course, we, and the, we have the other things where we, we got the iconic poster with her, her head shaved and she's kind of grimacing off to the side and she's got that other alien right in her face. Iconic moment. And I have to say Sigourney Weaver really delivered in all of these films. I thought it was a masterful performance and she really, really did a great job. And I think it's really one of the more iconic ones out there, along with Curly Starling. I, I was trying to not overlook anybody as I was compiling the list, but I, I can't help but include Ellen Ripley from the Alien franchise. Professor, Excellent. I'll hand it off to you. Who is number two on your list? Great call, by the way. Well, thank you. So number two for me is uh, Frida Innescourt, who played Lady Jane Ainsley in The Return of the Vampire, 1943, with uh, Bela Lugosi as the vampire who returns. Uh, Lady Jane Ainsley is awesome in this movie. She plays as much of a tough, you know, take no prisoners type as Professor Van Helsing ever did. Uh, it's on Spanguli uh, coming up uh, this coming Saturday. So keep an eye on Lady Jane Ainsley. She There's a kind of two periods where she kind of is confronted with this uh, vampire when she's younger. And then we get a little jump uh, later, which is, you know, several years later where she has a daughter and the vampire has decided he's taken a liking to the daughter. Um, and she just goes on a vampire hunt and I love it. So my number two pick is Frida Innescourt as Lady Jane Ainsley in Return of the Vampire. Who's your number one pick, Chris? And I think we have an agreement here. Well, Professor, I, I have to say, I, this was the first person that came to my mind when, when you posed this topic. And I have to say, I want to be fair. I want to make sure I'm not overlooking anybody, but it was... It was an e it was fast to circle through everyone else, and this was sort of a no-brainer pick for myself. This is an interesting character because this character died not once but twice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Both times had this character's death retconned <laughs> to do it. So with that, we'll, we'll we'll should we reveal both open our envelopes at the same time to yes, give our go selection? For it. All right, we'll both open go our envelopes, it. and we we both chose. Thank Jamie. you, Jamie. Jamie. Lee. Lee Curtis. Curtis as Laurie Strode <laughs> in the Halloween franchise. My gosh, Professor, I saw Halloween at an age, probably I was too young to see it, but it mm. left such an indelible impression on me that I just really, really had such empathy and sympathy for this Laurie Strode character. Yeah. And I thought Curtis was marvelous in this role and did all what she was asked of her. I could feel her tension. I could feel her the suspense and terror that she's going through. All the while trying to keep her head in together as this babysitter and keeping her charges safe. It was a marvelous performance. Halloween scared the bejesus out of me yes. when I first saw it as a kid. <laughs> it still scares me to this day. It's probably my most favorite horror film of all time. And I thought Curtis did an outstanding job and she embraced this role. And I really have to say, I I am so thankful for Curtis and what she did to this and how she basically comes keeps coming back and doing what's asked of her and what she brought to the table with this role. I'm going to get ahead of myself because, Professor, I think you're chomping at the bit to jump in on here. I, I, I'm going to stop being selfish. I will stop talking. I will let you take the floor. And please tell us your thoughts and impressions on Jamie Lee Curtis as Laurie Strode. Oh, just a, an amazing thing. I saw it in the theater when it came out. Big fan of this movie. Um, not so much a fan of the franchise, although I do like number three. where she's Fair point. It, so. Totally but, fair points. But this first movie is just classic in its simplicity. It's the kind of... Uh, you know, it's the guideline that so many of those 80s horror movies took, you know, with the final girl and uh, just how the scares, a couple, you know, fright scares and, you know, teenagers uh, being naughty with each other and then getting killed afterwards. Uh, and she was so good as the good girl who's, you know, babysitting other people's kids for Halloween so they can go off and have fun. And she's just the, the very slightly repressed, you know, sweater wearing, you know, good girl that even her friends think that she's too much of a goody goody and her friends don't actually survive the movie. So, <laughs> you know, what do they know? And Jamie Lee Curtis just brings an amazing vulnerability. She says, oh, I, I never, 
I never played a hero in that movie, you know, in the first movie in particular. You know, she's not a hero. She just plays it terrified. And I think that's what works. She's not, she doesn't have this great, um, you know, jubilant success where she kills the monster and everything. She plays this movie scared. And it works. And she's, even though she's scared, she's still fighting the creature. She's trying to save the kids that are in her, uh, that she's that she's looking after a uh, great character and a great actress, Jamie Lee Curtis. Uh, totally in agreement. And I thought your comments were spot on, Professor. Yeah, good, good too. stuff. Great, great call. So those are our frenzy faves. <laughs> just another Tom Baker day. These are our frenzy faves. Huh. Well, moving right along, <laughs> Professor, you put the following on social media. Oh, I get to do a voice. This is really, really good. Okay. Howdy, bud. Welcome to the Professor Frenzy Show, where we jaw about comic books, horror movies, and hard-working actors. Mosey on over, the barkeep will get you a sarsaparilla, and you can rest your bones and enjoy the show. <laughs> yeah. Nicely done. Yeah. Thank you. That'll come up again. <laughs> yeah, we got some great comments on this one. We heard from our buddy Doc Strange over at Billy D underscore Lucius, who says, hey, he loves this new segment. Well, thank Ooh, you. Good. I really appreciate the feedback. Yeah, this thank we're having you. some fun with this. I appreciate sure. it. And we also heard from our friend Mac Rocks. Thank you, Mac Rocks and Mac Rocks 56, who said, hey, another great, interesting show. Now, allow me to expand and clarify on some things from last time. Trading cards were five cents a pack in the 50s and 60s and went to 10 cents in the 70s. Comics were 10 cents in the early 60s, uh, but went to 12 cents. And then they went to 15 cents and then 25 Mm. cents. I stopped collecting when they were at 35 cents. Next, the man okay. from Uncle Cards were assembled and made a huge picture on their backsides. <laughs> he says, oh, next. I'm so sorry if I ruined your joke, Jerry. And he, he apologizes. Uh, Professor, no, yeah, can you counter with no that? No reason to apologize. I was trying to make a Chekhov's gun joke, but uh, it didn't work out. And I just kind of abandoned the joke, mid-joke. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's what happened. Yeah. And then uh, Mac Rocks continues along, and he also states that he also collected other cards besides baseball, like flag cards, which were smaller, mm. also wrestling, laugh-in, oh, yeah. football, dark shadows, etc. Wow. Mac Rocks continues, I wish I still had them all and my comics, but sadly, they are just a memory. That's why I love this show. It's nostalgia supreme. Blessings. Oh, well, thank you so much, Mac Rocks. You. Yeah. Professor, boy, yeah. I, I, you know, when I look at the reprints of the Batman cards, some of the Batman cards I have, yeah, don't fall asleep on the backs of them because they did sort of assemble a puzzle. I can't remember the price points. So thank you, Mac Rocks, for reminding me what they were, because when I got into board with my allowance, I would get a couple of comic books and a pack of wacky packages, mm. maybe a Slurpee if I was lucky at the 7-Eleven. And that's that's... That's where my allowance went. Was at the Seven Eleven. You think no, it'd go to a toy store. No, it'd go to some some something upper echelon. No, I, I burned through the whole thing and I got my weekly fix at the old Seven Eleven. So, <laughs> Professor, <laughs> I think we talked about this before. I think you also bought some baseball cards from back yeah. in the day. Did you not? I sure did. I, I collected baseball cards. I loved loved the graphics on baseball cards and just loved the whole vibe of them. But and I got wacky packs too. And I w- I think I would get periodically other other cards um but i wasn't a big collector i I was able to just collect baseball cards i just didn't have the space um shared a room with my brother the closet was tiny so there's only so much i could do Mm -hmm. i wish i had my comics and uh, baseball cards and stuff from back then too though boy professor do you recall when you started buying comics, like the first comic you ever bought yourself? Do you remember how much it cost? What the cover price is? Wow, the comic? I do not. I do remember being able to get a soda and a comic book, or a or a comic book and a like a a little um, um, candy bar, and I think my allowance was a quarter. So I think we would have to back into that. Um, how much mm-hmm. everything was might have been 12 cents 15 cents yeah it could have been it's possible that i could have done that i also might have got 30 cents but i think my dad gave me quarters i it seemed to recall it's so interesting that uh, mac rocks had a relative who just let him spurge because i remember yeah. when my uncle visited me in memphis you know typically i would i would get no more than two comics and mm-hmm. i thought i was that was a prince to me, but mm. one time I went with my uncle and he he gave me a whole dollar, which oh. meant I could get five comics. And it was like, 
this I, I I was not prepared for this expansion of my comic book library at so young an age because there were so many titles that I had no idea what they were about. I mean, I was typically getting a Richie Rich or a Batman. Now, okay, I'll get a Superman, but beyond that, what else is out there to get? I had no idea. Yeah. So do I, do I? What's spooky about by Harvey Comics? So I'm going to get a spooky. And I'll get a flash because I know he's fast, but I don't know what his adventures are like. And j- my mind was blown. You want to blow a kid's mind like that. You know, just always a custom. Hey, the bar is set at two, kid. You are not getting any more. This is the mandate from your dad. You're not yeah. getting more than two comics a week. And when to, when to leave a 7-Eleven with five comic books after one visit... Mind blown, yeah. mind blown, just just, just just things like that. And I maybe Mac Rocks, that's the feeling you had when your uncle allowed you to have a little bit more money to get like mm-hmm. all, the whole box of the cards. Can you imagine that? <sighs> just yeah, even as a kid, I can you imagine like uh, saving up your money to, to because I think as a kid, we were so used to buying packs of baseball cards, but can you yeah. imagine a kid just walking out with a box of baseball cards? My <sighs> mind would have been blown, my mind would have been blown as a kid to see that. I remember, I think it must have been in the maybe late 70s, early 80s, that you were able to buy the whole, you know, all the baseball cards in the set, Mm. right? So Mm -hmm. Tops would sell you the whole set of baseball cards. And that just seemed to me, I don't know, that seemed like any fun. Yeah, there there was something to it. Yeah, And back when I started, I just think having a complete set was unattainable. I thought there'd be yeah. something like regional that you wouldn't be able to find this card. But as we got closer, it was like, hey, I'm almost complete to a set. And then I found out that my buddy's little sister had a card that I needed to complete a set. And I was like, wow, I can't I didn't think I didn't think a complete set was attainable as a kid. I honestly didn't. I thought it was regional or there would be some just rare card that of some obscure player that yeah, you yeah. just could not <laughs> do it. You know, I mean this is this is so how cut off we were in our little own world as kids yeah. back in the day. You know, this was no unbelievable. Internet. No internet. Yeah. Uh comics were 20 cents. I remember that was the first price point. And going back as, as a little young collector, being in Memphis, being uh, going to comic shops in the Minneapolis greater area, going to the greater comic shops in the greater Detroit area, I tell you, even in the 70s, if you go into a comic book shop today, and if you want to find a comic book that's, say, 40 years old, no problem. Mm-hmm. There's a back issue from, from the 90s, yeah. all from the 2000s, from the 90s to the 80s. You'll find some comics in the 70s, pr- presumably if it's a well-stocked shop, sure. maybe even the 60s. Older than that, not so much. But if you want to go into a local comic book shop and find a back issue that's from the 70s or 80s, easily, no problem. Mm -hmm. I tell you, when I was a kid in the 70s, if you wanted a back issue from the 60s, good luck. I mean, the the, the price point sort of ended there. You would find some books in the 60s, but they basically, the line of demarcation out of all these shops that I went to stopped right at the 12th cent price point you would find no no other thing with a 10 cent cover price and not that those books were necessarily that old they would be like let's say anything from 50 to 20 years old forget about it you know that yeah. which sort of seems un- unheard of now if you want a comic book that's 15 or 20 years old in the local comic shop they will sell you a ton of those books that are that old but <laughs> yes. but back then trying it's to like find cars, a cars right yeah trying to find a book that old back then in all of those regions impossible you could find nothing with a 10 cent cover price they all started basically at 12 cents and it was unbelievable it, it's like today if you get a uh you know you can think i you know you can have a 20 year old car like a honda civic right uh, mm-hmm. uh 2001 honda civic that's 22 years old i have one of them uh can you imagine in 1975 having a 20 year old car that would have been a 1955 whatever no, mm-hmm. no, yeah. we didn't have them. There's something about we we have things, you know, back to the to the '90s and the '80s, but you know that's so long ago from now, you know, with the with baseball cards and and everything or uh, comic books, and it's just so weird that back when we were you know of that age. Things 50 years ago were not appearing in uh, in shops like they are today. Absolutely. Great, great point. Great, great point. It's, it's, it's weird how it works. You know, I, I just, yeah. I can't, I can't begin to uh, tell a, tell a generation <laughs> of, of, <laughs> how different of the things, it was. how different yeah. it was. Yeah. And uh, thank you, Max Ross, for bringing up wow. some of these memories. I do want to mention though, uh, my uncle had a box of those flag cards, which I totally forgot about. And I, I looked at him and I just didn't seem to have much interest in them for some reason. I, I sort of handed to him. I think they were passed down from another cousin. I just looked at them, you know, okay, they're kind, they're kind of cool, but I never really got into the flag cards like the baseball cards or the other things. You mean like country flags? 
Yeah, flags from uh, different countries. Yeah. Okay, no, I never got them. Never. Did, yeah, they were a little smaller as Mac Rooks, and I totally forgot about them. Mm. Had he not mentioned it in his in his reply, so I really appreciate that. Right. Uh, cards from TV shows. Yeah, great bag memory. I, I just don't know what TV show would be on a card <laughs> these days now, but yeah. Um, Really, the really Mandalorian, good stuff. maybe stuff like that. I'm sure. Yeah, there you go. Oh, that's yeah, that's a great franchise. And of course, yeah, they had Star Wars cars back in the day. So yeah, Mandalorian is excellent, excellent suggestion, Professor. Perfect, perfect stuff. Yeah. Oh gosh, I, I had a thought, but I lost it. But yeah, it, it, mm. it, times it was, change. It, times change. World. Times change, and I, when I remember that thought, I'll, I'll, I'm going to probably <laughs> share it on the next podcast. Awesome. Oh, awesome. Okay, we'll move right along. And we also heard from our friend Joey, Joey Galvez, who put a yeehaw gift <laughs> from Billy Crystal. And I don't know if it was from City Slickers 1 or 2, but it was Billy Crystal saying yeehaw, and I have to think it was one of the City Slickers movie. Thank you so much. I want to give a plug to uh, Hojo, The Mythicals, number two. Uh, sign up as live, and you can find it uh, on social media, on X or Twitter, at H. W D E S P E R H W Desper uh, Mythicals number two. Want to give it a plug? Uh, independent horror comic book. So want to make sure we got a plug out for that. Yeah. We also heard from Randy. Yeah, would not be complete if we heard from Randy at Randall Andrews one who said, "Well, bless my soul and weary bones. It's the Professor Frenzy show here to show us more rootin' tootin' fun. We got girls and we got free live music and oh, there's a zombie coming down the stairs." <laughs> There ain't supposed to be out till light time. Let me shoot it. Pew, pew. <laughs> Listen. Kill it. Everybody. Wow, Randy. That was good. Done. I love it. I love it. And not to be outdone at Soundtrack Alley, Randy chimes in with, come on over and enjoy the best show ever. That's right. You wandered into the Professor Friends of Town. Chris is a sheriff and we got them plenty good comics all around. Some horror, some sci-fi, some creepers, and some rootin' tootin' fun. Come back and hear it. Nicely done. Oh, Thank so you so good. much, Randy. And our friend Clinton on X at Coffee Comics BLG said, Yee-haw! Listen up, cowpokes. <laughs> Old Doc Frenzy has been cooking up <laughs> one of them podcasts again. We aims to form a posse and track him and that side white and snake Chris. <laughs> oh, be on the lookout for Frenzy Faves. They'll get you every time. Saddle up. It's a show. Oh, man. <laughs> Thank you so, so much, Clinton. Good. With that, we'll move on to our roll call of likes and retweets for this past show. Now, uh, Randy, I hope you don't mind, but I will defer to Clinton since we messed up on that one. And I, I will take the whole blame for that one. Clinton, you're on X slash Twitter at Coffee Comics BLG. Now, you also do a podcast called Coffee and Comics where you look at a comic in a t- in about the time it takes to down a cup of coffee. Occasionally, you'll have on a guest and ask some fascinating questions. You also do the Days of High Adventure podcast where you look at a sword and sorcery comic. And you also do Fan Film Fridays that you can find on the Longbox Crusade feed. And once you're there, you're also going to get treated to a whole, whole treasure trove of some excellent podcasts. Clinton, my apologies, my, my sincere apologies. And you can be found at Coffee Comics BLG. And with that, we'll move on to the roll call of likes and retreats for the past uh, episode. I'll give a shout out to our friend uh, who's reached emeritus status. It's our mascot. And that's Robin on x slash twitter at robin 031 robin robin here at the professor frenzy show we want to give our thoughts and prayers to you with respect to uh an injury that you're going through right now any time you get an injury it couldn't happen at the worst time and again this is not a good time to have an injury but here at the professor frenzy show please know that the professor jerry and myself of course are thinking of you and our thoughts and prayers go to you through this trying time we hope you yeah. get better soon. And listeners, please keep Robin in your thoughts as we are here at the Professor Frenzy Show. And yes. next up, we also heard from DS May Collins at May Air. We also heard from our friend. Yes, it's Kirk Spencer at Big Five Army. Thank you so much, my friend. Moving down the list, we also heard from Linda at Linda S I M P S 39192. We heard from our friend, hey, it's the Bearded Axe Mind of yeah. Horrors himself who's got a horror film in the works that it's coming out pretty soon. Yeah, the Bearded Axe Mind of Horrors is our friend at Chris Cartagena 8. If you're into horror, please check out our friend Chris at Chris Cartagena 8. Rick Rambles at Rick Rambles. Thank you so much. We really appreciate that. Please check out his podcast. Speaking of podcasts, check out our friend Doc Strange at Billy D underscore Licious. Great episode I got in the queue, guys. That's over at the Magazines of Monsters feed where you have the guys from the Bat Pod on. Oh, yeah. And the episode's in my queue. At the time of this recording, it came out 
the previous day. And as I was preparing for this show, I did not get a chance to listen to it. It is in my queue. I am all ready to listen to it. I'm sure you knocked it out of the park because once I saw the cover of what you guys are talking about, the Gene Colan Batman writing, getting in in that era, boy, this was a lot of buzz back in the day. Like you wouldn't believe uh, my friends back then. Gene Colan doing Batman. Oh my gosh. Can you imagine how that's going to look? The guy who does Tomb of Dracula drawing Batman. Wow. This is going to be really, really good stuff. Can't wait to listen. Doc Strange, thank you so much. Guys of the Bat Pop, I can't wait to listen to you on this episode. Looking forward to it. Randy, of course, you're over at Soundtrack Alley. That's a podcast where film is looked at and we see how music enhances it. That's really, really good stuff. Our friend Chris Lydon at Chris Lydon 7. We heard from our friend at Iowa's Joe. Now, he does a podcast called The 21st Century Boys that he does with a son. It's the father and son talking about comics. It's on social media at 21STCEN Boys. Thank you so much. Macrox, thank you for listening and making us part of your Wednesday at Macrox 56. Gregory Litchfield, thank you very, very much. This past week, you also countered with some comic book sound effects that I put out there. I brought a smile to my face, and I, for all the effort that you do, I applaud you, my friend. At Greg Litchfield, Greg has been a comic book reader and collector for 52 years, reviewing comics on a concise scale from 1 to 5. Not only does he look at contemporary material, he looks at books even going far back as the Silver Age. <laughs> Randy, let me give you another shout-out, my friend. You can find him at Randall Andrews 1. Soundtrack Alley, at Soundtrack Alley, of course. Marvelous, marvelous sketches. I want to make sure oh, I get yeah. a plug-in for that. So Clinton, good. I'm going to give you another plug. Coffee and Comics, at Coffee Comics BLG. Uh, we also heard from our friend, The Long Box of Darkness, at Dark Long Box. Two Sleeps, thank you for another fascinating, interesting, talented performance with some new set material that blew me away. I love the Johnny Cash song that you did on the last show, can't wait to see what you got in store for our listening audience today as we record this. Listeners, check out Two Sleeps. You can see it at Two Sleeps Twitch TV. You won't be disappointed. Concerts come out 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, 3.30 Eastern. Check your listings at Two Sleeps. Looking forward to this one. Can't wait to hear what you got. Oh, that Johnny Cash song blew me away. Can't wait oh, to hear it today. Stuff. Yeah. Our friend Joey Galvez. A lot of Kickstarters in the bucket, my friend. Let's see what you got in the hopper. Please check out at Joey Galvez, 1984. And I think we've got everybody. But as I said, we had some issues with the script this past week. If I overlooked you, my sincerest and deepest apologies, please let me know on X or Twitter at B-Tone Backlinks, or you can let the professor himself know at Professor Frenzy. We'll be sure to mention you on our next show. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Professor Frenzy Show. You can find our podcast if you do an iTunes search for The Professor Frenzy Show. You can listen to the show on Twitter and find me on Twitter at Professor Frenzy and Chris at BTO and Bat Books. Hey, we're on Facebook over The Professor Frenzy Show page. We're on Instagram at Professor Frenzy. We're now also on Amazon Music, and we are now also on YouTube. Just visit youtube.com slash Professor Frenzy, all one word. We are now also on TikTok, so go to Professor Frenzy 2 to see our videos. If you have an Android phone, the Professor Frenzy show is part of the free network. Just swipe right on your homepage and look in the art section of the podcast list. Whatever device you use, you can subscribe to our podcast feed by doing an iTunes search for Professor Frenzy. Thank you for listening to the Professor Frenzy show. Let us know on Twitter what you think about our show, and please help us get the word out to people that might like these kinds of comics. Thanks to everyone for listening. We look forward to chatting more about comics next week. And please remember, pick up your poll. Professor Frenzy. Professor Frenzy. All original content of the Professor Professor Frenzy Frenzy Show is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution, no derivatives, 3.0, unported license. Professor Frenzy. You are on the Frenzy Feed.